Welcome to the CIO Roundtable. I'm Sid All, the CIO of Private Client Endowments and Foundations at Brown Advisory. As we enter the fourth quarter, we wanted to drill down into one of the key themes of the year, inflation. We're also going to touch on some of the other major issues that may be top of mind for investors. This includes China, where regulatory crackdowns and concerns about its real estate sector are weighing on not just the country, but emerging markets more broadly. We're also going to look at the technology sector, where some high-profile tech giants may be facing increased regulatory scrutiny ahead. As the COVID crisis recedes somewhat, lawmakers around the world may be using newfound bandwidth to revisit tech regulation. To help answer these questions, I'm joined by Tom Graff, the head of fixed income at Brown Advisory and our resident macro expert, Erica Pagel, the CIO of our sustainable investing business, who brings a unique ESG lens to investing here at Brown Advisory. And I'm also excited to have Lauren Kahalen, an investigative analyst at Brown Advisory, who will tell us a little bit more about her role as an investigative analyst and shed some lights on the developments in the tech sector. But let's start with a recap of what is one of the most defining themes of the year, inflation. Earlier in the year, inflation expectations reached levels not seen in decades as several trends combined. We had highly effective vaccines arriving sooner than many thought, which set the stage for an economic reopening. We had historic fiscal stimulus and even more aggressive monetary stimulus from the Federal Reserve with their new average inflation targeting policy. We had pandemic-related supply chain disruptions and labor shortages that have curtailed the supply of goods and services just as demand was taking off. And we had record demand for goods as people have cut their travel and leisure spending as a result of COVID. We acknowledged then that inflation was likely to remain elevated for some period of time, and we made changes to portfolios. We reduced our exposure to rising interest rates by shortening the duration in our bond portfolios. We shifted some exposure from high growth stocks to less interest rate sensitive value stocks, and we increased our exposure to cash flow generating real estate and infrastructure assets, which could help protect us from rising inflation. We noted that many of these pressures might be transitory, self-correcting spikes in prices that would be met with increased supplies of goods as supply changes were mended, and potentially a shift in demand from goods to services. But we still took a cautious approach. We stopped short of recommending investments in commodities and precious metals that typically perform well in periods of heightened inflation because we didn't expect inflation to rise into the danger zone of 5% plus, which typically leads to poor performance for stock markets and great performance for commodities. In the case of gold, that's worked out. It's down on the year. But broader baskets of commodities have risen 30 to 40%. While some markets like lumber and soy have cooled as supply has increased and demand has fallen and supply chain issues have been worked out, other markets have actually been heating up and there are rising concerns that supply chain issues could last well into next year and maybe even 2023. Some examples of this are in the UK where natural gas prices are up 400% this year thanks to weak wind power generation and other factors that have pushed up demand for gas combined with shallow supplies from the UK's just-in-time approach to gas delivery. Meanwhile, transit times for goods from Shanghai to Chicago has doubled from 35 to over 70 days due to port congestion driven by demand for goods and shortages of labor. Those factors have led to a 300% increase in shipping costs and are expected to linger well into 2022. And meanwhile, agricultural commodity prices from coffee to cotton have risen 40 to 50%. Thus far, stock markets have been relatively unfazed by these moves. Global stocks are up 16%. The S&P 500 is up over 20% this year, as we're recording this in late October. And perhaps this is because these are all viewed as transitory inflationary pressures. But are they? Which businesses can navigate this volatile price environment and which can't? Which asset classes should we be leaning into and out of? As we kick off the fourth quarter, we wanted to examine how the inflationary landscape has evolved in recent months and how it's affecting the positioning of our client portfolios. So let's dive right in. Tom, I'll start with you. How transitory does inflation seem to you now? What's changed in the last few months and how has your view evolved? Yeah, Sid, I think six months ago, it was a little easier to call the inflation we were seeing transitory when it was primarily driven by things like used cars spiking by 10% in a month and airline tickets being uh, sold out from people desperate to travel. 
But in the last six months, inflation's really broadened out. So you could look at measures like the median CPI, which takes the sort of center, a single item that's at the center of the CPI report. Um, and that's a 3.7% uh, pace in the last six months. Or you could take a similar measure, which is the trim mean PCE, which sort of takes out the, the fastest rising items um, and measures where everything else is, and that's at 2.6%. So, you know, the most recent CPI report overall was 5.4. Certainly a number that high is transitory, but that inflation is probably running higher than it was before COVID, probably not transitory. So you made a statement there, which I'd love to dig into. You think a 5.4% number will definitely be transitory. Uh, would you kind of stand behind that as a comment? Yeah, because I think if you you know if you dive deep into the numbers, there's just a lot of things that, um, as you mentioned earlier, as either supply responds to higher prices or um, just as as uh, kind of demand spikes peter out um, in this kind of post COVID period, there ought to be some normalization of those prices, and then it's what's left over, right? And that. That has to do with what kinds of trends in demand can withstand. What are what are consumer incomes? What are the flexibilities of supply chains and the like? And so you've mentioned supply chains a few times. Um, has it surprised you uh, how long it's taking to resolve some of these supply chain issues? And and is that the factor that's leading to this broadening out of uh, of inflation, or is it more on on the labor side? Well, what's tricky, Sid, is supply chain isn't a black and white thing. Like calling something a supply chain issue is not a black and white thing, right? So, you know, for there to be a circumstance where there's not enough supply to go around, that implies there's too much demand for the amount of supply we have, right? And so I think if we were to survey all the various goods that are rising um, at an above average pace, we would probably find most of them have a supply issue, but most of them also have demand that's running hotter than was true pre-COVID, right? And so um, I, I, I think it's probably more helpful for investors to focus on the demand side, because in most cases, supply will adjust to the extent it can. Um, and then it's a matter of whether demand is still so hot that it's pushing pushing prices up. So, so I know it, it, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, I, I don't know that I'm surprised that the supply chains haven't righted themselves. What I'm sort of surprised by is that um, demand, even as sort of stimulus has waned and whatnot, that demand has remained this hot. I think it's interesting you bring up the demand side of the equation. I think I, I recently wrote in a, a blog post about, you know, the port of Los Angeles, right? We've got these 70 plus ships uh, that are or 65 uh, plus ships that are, are waiting to be unloaded. And part of that is uh, an issue of labor, uh, but part of that is an issue of just demand. So, you know, container volumes are up 30% year over year. Um, I wanted to quickly ask you, because it's become a topic du jour, you know, are we headed for stagflation, you know, a toxic combination of, uh, uh, slowing economic growth, higher unemployment alongside inflation. What do you make of people who say we're headed for stagflation? I think that's kind of taking two points on a on a trend line and just drawing it <laughs> too far. Um, because because I think what's going on is that you know economic activity is slowing from a torrid pace uh, this summer. Um, you know, the summer was the combination of, of items you mentioned, sort of this large stimulus and the vaccines coming online and everybody's like, finally, I can get out of the house. And as that torrid pace has diminished or, or is, is in the process of diminishing, um, we're going to have certain numbers slow down. You're going to retail sales slow down a little. You're going to have um, GDP in general slow down a little and the like. Um, but that's different than what we normally think of as slowing, right? Normally, um, when we've seen those kinds of things happen, we're transitioning from an expansionary phase to a contractionary phase. Here, we're probably just transitioning from a spike to a normal. And, and, and so I think we should really focus on is what does normal look like? Let's not, let's not get overexcited by just the fact that the last two points seem to be pointing down. 
Well, let me transition for a moment then to the labor situation, because I know uh, you and I have talked about how surprising um, some of the statistics have been uh, in terms of labor force participation. You know, people aren't coming back to work to meet this, you know, the unmet um, uh, job need uh, in, in America, at least, the way that we might have thought. What, is something structurally changing in the labor market in the U.S., and is this something that could put continued pressure on both inflation and perhaps constrain growth in the years to come. Yeah, I, I think you got to conclude that it, that, it, that it has to be right. So, as you as you said, you and I have had this conversation. I, uh, Twelve months ago, I would have guessed that labor force participation would have rebounded a good bit, um, particularly if I knew how high um, or how hot the wage market was going to be. Um, but we just haven't seen it, and even though at this point. The expanded unemployment benefits have fallen away. Schools started, like sort of all the excuses we, we might have given for why folks were waiting to come back into the workforce, they kind of come and gone. And um, so, I, so I think we just got to, you know, look at the data and, and listen to what the data is telling us that something structural has changed. Now, the mo what's most likely here is that there's some amount of people who um, worked, maybe there were two income houses and one uh, persons decided to stay home with the kids. Maybe someone someone got an early retirement package during the COVID era and just decided they're 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 hanging it up. Um, I don't I don't I don't know what proportion those are. There's kind of if you look dig into the data, there's no smoking gun for those things. Um, but I think what for investors, what we ought to focus on is the labor market we see now. It's probably going to be the labor market for the foreseeable future. So when we're thinking about margins, when we're thinking about wage growth, when we're thinking about all these things, we should just assume it's going to be tough to hire people and it's going to be expensive to hire people. That's, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, let me turn it to Erica right now and talk about you know one of the other drivers or potential drivers of inflation. And maybe you could start by you first defining what is greenflation? Yes, the greenification of economic investment terminologies. There's greenomics, there's greenium, which is actually the greening of commodities. And then we also have greenflation, which is will moving to a more sustainable future result in rising costs? Will green technologies and materials lead to sustained price increases throughout the supply chain? And regulation and low carbon emission targets, some believe, are creating increased demand for products and limited supply. Several commodities that are used in renewable energy technologies like solar, wind, or electric vehicles. If you look at aluminum, it's up more than 50 percent. Copper, up more than 30 percent. Lithium, used in batteries and, and other technologies, is up more than 300 percent. But it's not just renewable energy demand that is driving several of these input costs higher. So if you look at oil and natural gas, prices are spiking recently. Um, for that, it's production levels. Remember, oil went negative at the beginning of the pandemic. So did electricity prices in some regions of the world. Production was stalled. Um, in some places, production was cut and it hasn't yet picked up. There are governments and organizations that, that could also help intervene and help stabilize the market. Um, and then there's other areas that are impacting price, right? There's the surge in demand from the reopening from the pandemic, a broad shift away from coal and falling inventories. So broadly, the supply chain is stretched. Rising energy prices, which, which we know they can have short-term ripple effects globally for governments, for companies, for consumers. So, so lots of other drivers other than just uh, the transition, and I know we've talked about this in the past, you do expect the transition perhaps could bring more volatility, it'll be a bumpy ride. Could you talk a little bit about the, the potential long-term deflationary impacts of shifting to renewable energy? So on the flip side, higher traditional energy prices might be exactly what is needed to increase innovation uh, and to continue to accelerate that energy transition. These higher prices may also make forms of renewable energy more attractive. But as you mentioned, there is going to be volatility. Wind and solar are at the mercy of Mother Nature. 
they are weather dependent. Um, you know, the International Renewable Energy Agency reported last year that more than 60% of all of the added renewable energy generation had a lower cost than the cheapest fossil fuel option. So technology innovation could help the cost curve and drive lower prices over time. It's, it's a technology decarbonization learning curve, if, if you will, as innovation drives usage or capacity, there's often a tipping point that results in a declining cost curve and a deflationary environment. And we've seen that in solar. The price of solar modules declined steadily since 2010 as new scalable technologies were introduced from 2009 to 2019 that cost of electricity from new solar plants actually declined 90%. If you look at that cost of electricity from wind, it was down 70%. And during this time, coal was pretty stable. So, you know, the question is, energy prices could possibly be even higher today if it were not for those renewable options that we have. That's a really good point. And when you kind of think about that, project that out five years, 10 years, the cost of extracting natural resources, staying stable or increasing. Certainly in the case of oil, we're going, you know, farther and farther out into the ocean, drilling deeper and deeper at more expensive uh, levels. And, and, and as the cost curve's coming down for renewables, you'd imagine uh, that could eventually have a deflationary impact. Maybe I could shift gears and ask a little bit about what's going on in the semiconductor market right now. We hear a lot about chip shortages, uh, and and the impact on inflation and you know some of that is the electrification of vehicles, um, but what else is is impacting this shortage in your mind, Erica and, and Tom as well, and and how persistent could that impact be? Right. So where are the chips? Uh, it's been very well publicized the shortages of semiconductor chips or microchips and the impact on the auto industry, which which you highlighted. However, these chips are actually used in a large range of products, right? So computers, kitchen appliances, and then uh, as a major input in uh, the digital part of our economy, uh, areas like mobile devices. And so last year, we saw a spike in at-home technology that drove the initial disruptions in the industry. We uh, pr Production then ramped up, uh, but it still has not been able to meet demand. There's overseas producers, several of which have had their own drawbacks recently. There's been power outages and fires, and that's only exacerbated a, a very fragile supply chain. Uh, Intel uh, estimates that semiconductors will account for over 20% of the input costs for new premium cars. That's up from 4% in 2019. Companies like Taiwan Semiconductor, they're spending on CapEx to increase their production capacity and build new facilities. So in autos specifically, uh, the production gap of new cars has led to a surge in used car prices this year. Tom mentioned earlier that um, you know, more than, or, more than or, or nearly two thirds of headline inflation over the past year has been driven by a few areas, uh, fuel, used vehicles, travel related components. However, in, in recent months, you know, prices of rent and, and few, food are, are larger components of household expenditures. We've, we've seen that on the rise. So, and now we have net energy costs that are, are rising. Uh, so we're seeing inflation pressures across the supply chain um, and bottlenecks, but you know, the, the impact of semiconductors, it's, it's not only on auto manufacturers, um, there's many other industries that are, are being impacted makes me think of what we've been talking a lot about in terms of you know business quality and the pricing power that you have as we talk about semiconductors, thinking about a company like Taiwan Semiconductor that we own and lots of our external managers own and, and the kind of position that they've been in right now in this market to provide mission critical services, raise price, uh, maintain and, and even expand their margins. So maybe Tom, I could go back to you and just ask you know what role consumer behavior and mindset plays in inflation. You know, we talk about this, it, it's, a, it's a monetary issue, but it's also just, are 
uh, consumers going to believe that goods won't be available or they're going to cost a lot more in the future, so they're going to rush out and buy things today. I think of conversations I've had recently with grandparents in our families looking you know, in September for Christmas present ideas because they're worried there won't be anything left on Amazon. How close are we to this bleeding into mindset and how important is that? Well, I mean, grandparents don't want to show up to Christmas empty-handed, that's for sure. I think, I think look, I, consumer um, behavior absolutely matters. Um, and so there is, there's sort of a psychological element to it. Con- economists have long said that inflation expectations are somewhat self-fulfilling. Um, that may, may be a reason why inflation stayed so low in the post-financial uh, crisis expansion. So, um, so that if that reverses, that certainly matters. I think just as important, though, is sort of how consumers feel about their own income and their own ability to spend. Um, because really, you know, we can talk about uh, the supply chains and the cost push pressures and all those things. But if consumers don't have the income to spend, then it does, then you know companies can't raise prices. And so, um, you know, we're looking carefully at both wage growth as well as kind of overall consumer income. Um, we ran recently uh, total household disposable income minus government transfers has risen at about a 7% pace the last six months. That's versus only 4% in the 2014 to 2019 period. So like consumers, if they feel flush, plus they feel like I better get my stuff while I can, like that's definitely an inflationary mindset. So uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about what could relieve some of the inflationary pressure here. I mean, one of the things that we noticed is inflationary pressures and interest rates were were falling um, in the second quarter and, and into the summer. And, you know, one of the things that happened was we had a spike in COVID cases. We had the Delta variant, and that probably delayed some of the shift from spending on goods, which are clogging the ports uh, all over the country, to uh, to services, and so we we saw things kind of worsen. Uh, obviously, cases are now down in the U.S. by 50 percent from peak levels. Uh, theoretically, you know there there may be more of that shift we've been waiting for from spending on goods to services. Uh, what are other things that could provide a little bit of relief? Well, in the short term, um, you know, we already mentioned that there's probably going to be some burn off of some sort of special cases. So from a kind of measurement perspective, there'll be some natural decline. But if we think more, more importantly, to think about that pressure, that pressure that you mentioned. Um, and look, I, I've, I've said a few times, this is the weirdest recovery of all time. So it's, it's, it's got a combination of items we've never seen before. Obviously, there's the pandemic issues, but there's also sort of the treatment of policy the, the Federal Reserve is going into this with a different attitude towards inflation than we've ever had before. And so it could be that the most important force that has been holding down inflation for the prior 30 years was things that are endemic, like globalization and technology and whatnot. And maybe that stuff just naturally takes over and pulls inflation back down into the mid ones or so. But if it really was an expectations thing, and if a different kind of policy and a different consumer mentality and more income changes the mentality, well, then then that'll be pretty different. I was just going to say, I'm not getting a lot of confidence here. Um, <laughs> this, this doesn't sound like we're, we have a lot of countervailing uh, <laughs> countervailing trends. But I think I think in the long run, there's some there are there is some great news, and that is you know companies aren't going to just sit back and do nothing in the face of all these supply chain challenges, and then frankly, just the difficulties of getting enough labor. They're going to invest in strengthening their supply chains, making them more resilient to change, and then also probably um, productivity enhancing investments that can help um, reduce the need uh, for labor. And so I think, um, and that's that's great news. We had a, had a, a sharp underinvestment in CapEx um, in the prior decade. And so if the combination of some things Erica mentioned, so sort of greenification of a lot of our economy, plus this uh, improvement in resilience and improvement in productivity caused a CapEx boom, that's an incredibly bullish thing, probably both for markets, but also certainly for the real economy. 
So we've heard this from some of our um, internal analysts here, especially those on, on our industrials team about uh, in, in quarterly conference calls this quarter, management teams talking about increasing meaningfully their investments. So this CapEx boom idea, I'm curious, you know, Erica, what you would have to share you know, on a kind of company level um, or, you know, broadly uh, an industry level in, in terms of that. Yeah, CapEx is an indicator of a company's future focus, and spending took a big hit in the first two quarters of last year, and we are seeing a pickup in investment. Many industry experts estimate that the rise will be the largest since the great financial crisis. Interest rates have allowed companies to borrow more, and companies have cash. Consumer spending started the recovery, and capital investment should help drive and sustain economic growth going forward. Amazon is a great example. They announced last year that they ramped up investments in their logistics. And then we'll probably see more ESG capex. Many companies in carbon-intensive industries are sinking meaningful capex into climate mitigation. So what is that? That's structural improvements to operations. It's finding ways to transform products and services. And going back to auto companies, uh, several um, manufacturers have announced transformative forays into EV or electric vehicle production. Bloomberg actually recently reported that several have pledged approximately half of their long-term R&D and CapEx budgets on EVs or other digital initiatives. So the likes there of Volkswagen, GM, and Ford. So right now it's a little bit like LeapFrog. As soon as one player jumps in in an industry, others will, will likely follow. You know, when I think about inflation being persistent, I, I wonder how it's going to impact markets. Clearly, rising inflation, rising rates, not good for duration in, in fixed income portfolios. Uh, it could pose a risk to, to valuations, uh, especially in the higher growth end of the market. We've also just worried about lower quality businesses that don't have pricing power, you know, seeing a margin impact. I'll admit I've been a little pleasantly surprised as we're, you know, uh, not quite a quarter of the way through earnings season, but, you know, we've seen a pretty strong earnings season uh, for the S&P. Margins are, are holding in there. We've seen more than 80 percent of companies uh, beating expectations. We've seen uh, stocks seemingly respond relatively well. But, you know, what are the things that you're worried about uh, right now, Erica, uh, if inflation is more persistent, if this lasts not 12 months or 24 months, but uh, perhaps even longer? And, and what might you do about it? Yeah, you know, the, the question is, um, you know, first, what's been winning, what's been losing with um, with the inflation that, that we've started to see and, and how persistent will it be? This is an extraordinary time. The bull market just keeps expanding. And over the past year, you've seen growth companies that have had significant appreciation on improving fundamentals, but then they've also benefited from a low rate environment. And then as news of a vaccine surfaced early last fall, you started to see the cyclical recovery. And there's so much conversation right now about inflation, but the markets overall do not seem that phased. Um, but the reality is, is inflation has been a winning trade this year. So we've talked a lot about commodities. Uh, we've talked about value and more cyclical companies. Energy, financials, and real estate are the top performing sectors this year. If you look at small cap, um, an area that was particularly hard hit last year at the onset of the pandemic, the, the small cap value, Russell 2000 value, it's, it's outpaced growth now by about 20%. And, you know, other areas that, that might be more traditional, buying gold, uh, that has not held up from a, a return standpoint, Bitcoin or, or what some actually call digital gold, that's also been volatile. Uh, these are two places that are, are really focused on, on supply and demand. So absolutely, uh, right now the focus is on earnings season. What will the rest of the year look like? How will companies be able to pass through price increases 
uh, as well as offset higher wage costs um, and mitigate some of these bottlenecks. And you know, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is a focus on margins. And you know, the good news is underlying fundamentals at a lot of these companies that have reported so far, they seem strong. That momentum has continued from the first and second quarter of this year. Uh, and so far, margins, um, yes, they're, they're being impacted. I think most, if not many companies are citing all of these issues we're talking about, but, but they've been able to, to offset them and, you know, acquire, um, you know, either through, through pricing or um, leverage with, you know, within their um, financials. So you've seen some really high quality companies. I think about, you know, Microsoft just announced their raising price for the first time, um, uh, meaningfully in in nearly a decade, kind of 15% across the board. Um, we saw Fast and All, industrial company um, that, that we own, uh, raising price and, and actually increasing their margins this quarter. I talked about Taiwan Semiconductor, you know, some really high quality uh, technology industrial uh, businesses um, uh, being able to deal with this environment well. What companies or industries do you think will continue to struggle? Pricing power is not the easiest to measure, right? How much above marginal cost can a company sell a product without negatively impacting volume or market share? So what we're looking for are companies that have those strong underlying fundamentals, strong cash flow, strong balance sheet, and that they can manage to this margin pressure. Um, so as you mentioned, um, Microsoft, they recently announced that it would increase prices uh, next year. They've kept subscription pricing pretty stable for, for several years. But then we've also seen it in payment processing. So Visa, MasterCard, they also announced that they intend to, to raise prices next year. Um, we're also seeing, you know, with, with supply chain shortages in freight and trucking, uh, there's some near-term price bumps that are happening in certain industries. So a few transportation companies are, are now marking up rates. We've also seen some packaged goods uh, and retailers pre-announce on margin pressure and revised guidance um, specifically pointing to higher cost. And this is a time where we think that quality should win. High quality, large caps continue to outperform. Investors right now are seemingly willing to give a pass for slightly lower margins in order to own quality. Uh, and there's not a lot of places to go right now. And you know what we've seen so far in, in third quarter earnings is that they're coming in better than feared. And then if, if you take a look at the consumer, don't forget the past year has, has been buy double of everything, right? So you go to the grocery store, instead of buying one toothpaste, you buy a package of two, or maybe you buy two or three packages just, just in case, right? And so when is some of that double purchasing, or I guess we're, we're all now in a hoarding behavior mentality, when, when does that ease? And is that going to last through year end? And, and will we see some of that ease next year? I think the pictures that we all see circulating online of empty shelf space in grocery stores in the U.S. and the U.K. and, and elsewhere would suggest it's not over yet, but hopefully will be soon. You know, another place that we've been hiding out in portfolios or, or investing in to try to protect against inflation is real estate and, and infrastructure. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you find is the appeal of, of those asset classes in a time like this. The S&P is striking distance to all-time highs. Valuations in many areas are extended, and there's a lot riding on low rates and accommodative central banks. And you know, in a scenario where there's increasing growth and a moderate rise in interest rates, you know, equities can actually be an effective way to hedge inflation. But there are headwinds, which we've talked about today. And as a result, we've been emphasizing diversification within portfolios. And for many clients, we have an alternative bucket or allocation. And what we've focused that area on, particularly over the past year, year and a half, is a search for income. How can we supplement a part of a client's stability or fixed income allocation, but also as a way to offset any equity market volatility and potential inflation? So over the past year, we've recommended a, a global listed infrastructure portfolio, but we've also recommended uh, some more liquid real estate options for, for client portfolios. And specifically in, in real estate, we like the consistent cash flows. Uh, the strategies that have um, really garnered our attention uh, are those that are focused more on multifamily, 
uh, as well as industrial, so apartments and warehouses, uh, as opposed to long office leases. But that consistent cash yield or, or cash flow has been attractive in this um, pretty much nominal income environment that we're seeing out of fixed income. Yeah, speaking of the nominal environment out of fixed income, maybe I'll kick it to Tom for a second. We were talking about this the other day, noting that the inflation-adjusted yield on the 10-year bond is, is basically at, at record lows, you know, minus 1%. And I'll put you on the spot a little bit. I, I know you've mentioned that your recommendation for clients is to have as little fixed income in portfolios as they would need to provide the kind of diversification and, and liquidity and protection that they desire. Maybe you could expand on that or, or correct me if I've gotten that wrong. I know that might sound a little weird coming out of the mouth of the bond guy, but uh, first of all, acknowledge real, re real yields on treasury bonds are basically at all-time lows. And so uh, after adjusting for expected inflation, not just the inflation we see right now, but expected inflation over the long term, you're, gonna, you're getting less out of fixed income than ever. But actually, that doesn't figure that much into what when I say that you probably ought to minimize fixed income that much, because in general, the safety assets that a client has has opportunity cost. Maybe the opportunity cost is somewhat higher right now than normal. But regardless, you know, the client ought to think about how much uh, liquidity, how much absolute safety do they need. Uh, make sure that that allocation fits that bill within reason, but then make that as small as possible because everything else you're going to invest in probably makes more money. And if you have that, a solid liquid allocation that kind of buys you freedom to do some of these other things that you and Eric have been talking about, some less liquid stuff or more volatile stuff that can have more upside. It gives you, sort of buys you not just the liquidity, but the time to sort of live through that variant. So, you know, we're going to be here for you, but we should be a pretty small percentage of your portfolio. We know you'll always be here for us, Tom. Um, we're certainly not advising people to give up on fixed income in their portfolio, right? I mean, I would note I've seen so much capital flowing into real estate and private credit. We've seen, you know, a real institutional shift, structurally reducing fixed income and, and adding to these asset classes, and we're seeing an impact on pricing, right? Cap rates are coming down in real estate, and, you know, rates are coming down in private credit so that, you know, we need to apply more leverage in order to get the same return. So risks are building and valuations are increasing. And um, so, you know, that uh, the operating bucket that we talk about of, of liquidity that you need to meet multiple years worth of spending and become in times of market stress uh, is is still incredibly important. So uh, we're not leaving you, Tom. That's good. I'm not leaving you either. While, while I'm uh, chatting with you, uh, I'd like to shift away from inflation and just talk about another big story of the day, which is uh, what's going on in China. We're not going to talk about the regulatory crackdown here and the disappearance of Jack Ma and so on and so forth, but I'd like to talk about this distress at the country's largest property developer, Evergrande. And just could you talk a little bit about it? It's the biggest property developer in China. The bonds are trading at 20 cents on the dollar. Uh, there's worry that this could become a little disorderly. You know, what impact could this have on, on the markets? Well, it's funny. So it seemed uh, just a few days before the quarter end that it was going to be one of the biggest stories of the quarter. And it faded really quickly. But I think um, you know, it faded more as an acute, immediate issue. Some people were talking about a Lehman moment um, that it, it probably never that probably never made sense. But that there could be some um, fundamental shift in how property development operates in China, but also how they kind of treat creditors. That 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 could be pretty meaningful. It just will take a little more time. It's healthy and probably a good step in China's kind of financial development to allow a bankruptcy to play out. So, so, so that's good, but it's, it's really not going to be without consternation. So we've seen a lot of property developer bonds sell off as we try to figure out um, what this all means. We'll say the wider um, kind of contagion has been very minimal. Um, there's been some sell-off in Chinese high yield more broadly, 
but even that has been fairly contained. And then there's been really no ripple elsewhere in credit markets. So um, I think markets are properly viewing this as more of a, it's a local issue. There could be impacts on other companies if you sell into the Chinese property market for sure. So you're gonna look at that. But it doesn't seem to be this kind of global panic that for a few days look like look like could be an issue. I mean, another interesting angle, uh, this kind of China and then broader emerging markets issue is that with interest rate volatility picking up here as central banks start talking about hiking and the like, that's often coincided with foreign exchange volatility and often been most acute in emerging markets. We've seen some pressure in Turkey and Brazil and so, so Sid, what what are we doing? How do you think that impacts client portfolios? It's a good question. I mean, certainly a a stronger dollar has historically not been great for emerging markets. If we assume we're eventually going to start raising rates here, that's been part of the discussion for a while. That you know the dollar could see some strength and put pressure on emerging markets currencies. We're seeing that pressure already. I was looking at the Brazilian real the other day. We, you know, we were at three to the dollar just a couple of years ago. Uh, we're uh, nearing six now, and inflation rates there are are approaching double digits, and that has just put a lot of pressure on the stock market. Um, so, you know, it's it's definitely impacting uh, emerging markets in in a uh, in a negative way. And you add on to that, we talked about Evergrande in, in China. Uh, and the regulatory issues in China, I, you know, would just underscore that many global investors are, are taking a bit of a, uh, a second look at their allocations to China because of uh, this pretty meaningful shift in policy. Some of this regulation may be catch-up regulation, um, but some of it is uh, was fairly unexpected, and the fact that it can be made kind of outside of a normal political process with very little lead time and preparation, um, you know, brings about a level of uncertainty you just don't see in other markets that probably requires uh, a, a lower valuation on earnings and cash flows coming out of uh, China. So I know that's something we've been thinking about. Uh, some of those valuation discounts are already very much baked in and sentiment is extraordinarily negative. Um, I know specifically with regard to China, we have not abandoned um, uh, our, our investments there. We have not added to them. Uh, it's still an enormous economy, one that is likely to be larger than the U.S. Uh, within the next decade or two. It's still a very large liquid market. It's got a, a very active venture capital ecosystem that's creating some really interesting companies. And it's also a really inefficient market. Lots of retail investors dominating the trading there, you know, 70 percent retail versus, say, 20 to 30 percent in the U.S. So there's a lot of opportunity for alpha and outperformance there. But, you know, I think outside of Asia in emerging markets right now where we don't have that structural growth and we have these inflationary issues, you know, we've been certainly reticent to, to add exposure. I don't know, Eric, if you'd add anything there. As, as far as thinking about emerging markets, I mean, this is a question that, that we're being asked a lot by clients right now and whether or not we're going to add to positions or reduce positions. And, you know, we are maintaining holdings and there's a couple of areas that that we would like um, to see before um, either um, considering any of those those other options. And, you know, the first is. Um, just uh, some, uh, you know, consistency or reduction in the pace of regulatory focus or action. So we're really looking for stability there. We also look at a lot of our uh, external managers and, and what they're doing. So signs that those managers are really starting to lean into the area um, or lean into the region or different segments of the market, um, you know, that that would be a good signal to us. But um, right now, you know, we, we feel very good about um, the current investment managers that, that we have in the region um, and how they're mitigating the, the current environment. So I guess summing this up, I mean, Erica, I, I might kick it to you, but I'll start by saying we haven't changed our positioning that much over the last few months, despite, I think, a slightly worsening inflationary picture, uh, still short duration in fixed income, still trying to be balanced between growth and value within equities. We're 
uh, allocating to real estate and infrastructure assets a little bit at the expense of fixed income. And, uh, and generally speaking, we're, you know, credit spreads are tight. And so we don't have a, a lot of uh, credit risk in portfolios. We don't have high yield fixed income allocations and, and the like. Anything else you'd, you'd add to that? I think that's right, Sid. Um, and, you know, reflecting on, on this time and, and it's been a volatile and, and more challenging market environment over the past, um, you know, 14 to 18 months, We've also seen some options in private credit options that offer attractive yields and can be inflation hedges in portfolios. From an asset allocation standpoint, um, we're we're pretty neutral and um, we're much more focused on finding concentrated high conviction strategies in each asset class or geography and in short, we are positioned for a wide range of, of outcomes right now. So it, the other two things that we've talked about more, but we still haven't acted on, are, are commodities and tips. I think in the commodity area, we typically don't have a lot of exposure to commodities. These are assets that don't have cash flows, that are dependent on pretty volatile supply-demand balances that are affected by all of the supply chain issues. And kind of buying a basket of oil at 80 and natural gas at 5 and uh, agricultural commodities up 40% on the year uh, is not something that is necessarily preferable to investing in cash flow, generating real estate and infrastructure assets where you get paid to wait. You know, and I think on, on the tips side of things, generally speaking, if rates are going up, tips will do better than treasuries, but they, they tend to lose money and do actually worse than cash. And if we expect inflation to continue to stay at a reasonable level and, and rates to continue to rise, tips won't be a great place for us to hide out. We, we talked earlier a lot about inflation pressure. Tips only get paid on realized inflation. So if it's just inflation pressure that the Fed responds to, real rates are going to rise and tips aren't going to be a protection. Yeah, and right now tips are pricing in 2.7% um, you know, annualized inflation. So let's turn now to another area that's been of growing importance to investors, the potential for additional regulation out of the major tech companies. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, Lauren Cahalan, an investigative analyst for Brown Advisory. So thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Sid. Maybe we could start just with a definition. What is an investigative analyst at Brown Advisory? Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of level set on what the investigative analyst role is on the um, equity research team here at Brown Advisory. So I am essentially a generalist at heart. Um, I work across our entire team of about 50 investors all of our sectors, all market caps, um, and all of our strategies. And so what this role is, is it's essentially special projects where we do deep dive analysis and then primary field work interviews. Um, so that sounds a little vague, so let me give you some, give you some examples of what that, what that ends up looking like. So there tends to be three projects that can kind of fit into the investigative world. The first one is what we can kind of consider um, survey research. And so this is an art, not a science, um, but a good example of this is something where we have a product, we're really interested in it, um, and so we want to go and talk to users of the product and kind of just get a feel for what people are thinking. Um, a good example of this is in healthcare, so we might be interested in a medical device. Um, one project we recently did was on insulin pumps, and so we learn all about diabetes, and then we go out and we talk to both endocrinologists and insulin pump users to try to get an understanding of where these companies are placed in the market and what people are thinking. So that's kind of your typical investigative, um, kind of pure investigative project. Uh, a second bucket of project types is something we might call like a quick fix. So what's something where we need kind of all eyes on something for like a few days? Um, and this could be something along the lines of drive to rural Virginia and go to a bunch of Walmarts and talk to people in their vision centers. Um, or it could be, you know, we really need to understand wildfire liability law in Oregon for one of our public utilities that we might hold. Um, and so it's a wide range of things, but you know, it's, it's really specific. It might involve like going to the site and talking to people, um, things like that. And so then this third bucket and the final bucket of, of investigative type projects is what I tend to call the nebulous issue. So these are huge, complex, tangled up problems um, where our team needs a few extra eyes on the issue. So our fundamental analysts uh, cover 
a lot of different companies, and there might be some thematic issues that we can see and connect dots on that we need an additional person to look at. And so a great example of this is tech regulation. This has been a project we've been working on since about April 2019, um, and it's just been helpful for us to think about frameworks to think about these really complex issues. So that's a little bit of color on what the role looks like. It's a lot of deep dive analysis and then going to find the right people to talk to um, on a variety of different issues. I love that. Uh, so it's you know kind of a combination of seeking that informational advantage uh, that that we look for in in, uh, in valuing businesses and and risk management and uh, and just staying up to speed with a 24-hour <laughs> news cycle. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned um, o over the last couple of years in that nebulous tech regulation uh, uh, research. You know, what are the pressures that these companies are facing? And, you know, how, how real uh, are they? Do they have teeth? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's an excellent question. So this, to give you some context, this project started out um, back in 2019. We were coming up on the one year anniversary of GDPR being implemented in the EU. So that's the EU's data privacy law. And we wanted to understand what data privacy law meant for big tech companies. Um, about two months later, you saw announcements in the US around you know, uh, the, the Department of Justice and the FTC were gonna look at big tech companies. So specifically Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. And so all of a sudden, all of these topics became intertwined and tech regulation is just kind of this catch-all term. And so, through a variety of primary research kind of uh, tasks, you know, going down to DC, listening to congressional hearings, going to meetings at the Department of Justice and the FTC, um, we were able to talk to a lot of different experts and try to understand these issues. And so what we've done as a team is think about tech regulation in three specific buckets and issue areas. So the first is data privacy, second is antitrust, and third is content moderation. And so obviously these, there's more than just these three and all these three are intertwined, but this helps us conceptualize these complex issues. And then we can tie back these concepts back to the business models and back to the fundamentals. And so if we, we kind of split up these, these three areas, I think the key thing to recognize when we talk about these three issue areas is the difference between enforcement of existing laws and the potential creation of new laws. And so what we've seen in, in kind of from that 2019 start date of when we started this project, is you saw the, the thinking through of enforcing existing laws. And what you've started to see in 2021 is the potential creation of new laws and new rules, uh, mainly around antitrust is kind of the general focus, both in the US and the EU. But you're also starting to see content moderation come up more, as well as um, data privacy. So these are kind of the themes that carry through, but using this framework helps us simplify uh, these really complex topics to help us understand how it impacts the fundamentals, potentially. And which of those three areas do you think could theoretically have the greatest financial impact? It's a, it's a really great question, and it's different for each company. And I think that's what's key to co come back to is that, uh, you know, We'll see headlines about big tech and these companies get lumped together and they're all incredible, have different business models. So I think one, one area that's been interesting to us specifically around antitrust is less so about breaking up. That's not really a concern to us. Let's say something gets broken up. Okay, that's a potential additional investment for us. Um, if we like the fundamentals, that could be an additional way for, for us to be invested. Um, we are looking at what are potentials to potential impacts to changing um, underlying business drivers. And so one of the things that's out there being discussed is around prohibiting self-preferencing. So the EU has a, a law um, that's kind of moving through their process called the Digital Markets Act. Um, and then in the US, we've started to see a bill come through Congress, both in the House and recently proposed in the Senate, that are looking at, should we be banning companies from self-preferencing their own products on their own platforms? And so this is something that's really interesting to us as far as you could see it in Apple's App Store. You could see it in Google with their um, vertical search products. When you type in cheap flights, Google Flights might be is the first thing that pops up. Um, and so those are the things that are really interesting to us is that could change a behavior model within a, uh, a growth driver. And so those are some of the things that we're thinking about um, as far as how it would impact the fundamentals. The big question that's out there that we are still trying to wrap our head around is on content moderation. It's a really complex topic. The world is trying to figure out uh, what it means as the companies are, as we are as investors. 
Um, so that's one that there's a lot of uncertainty around, and it's, it's a challenge to understand as we try to piece that together. I mean, these companies in many ways have never been more central to our lives. You know, uh, everyone, certainly post pandemic, is probably even more glued to their phones, uh, interacting with the internet for commerce, for socialization. Do you think it's fair to say that, you know, this increased importance that has emerged through the pandemic has pushed some of these issues to the front burner? It's a really great question, Sid. So, what we've seen through the pandemic, if we kind of go back to March 2020, there there was a question on our team at one point of COVID is happening, the world is shut down, there's bigger issues out there. Do you think that all this tech regulation discussion is going to fall to the side as some policy topics tend to do? And that was a that was a question we had. And as you've watched it play out, I wouldn't say you, you've seen the opposite. Say you there's there's a spotlight on the role that technology plays in our lives. And so while we were all so thankful that a lot of these tech products were there during during the pandemic and lockdown, that we were still able to stay connected. And, you know, um, you're connecting with your friends through Facebook products. You're still uh, using, you know, Google schools are using Google to access school for free virtually, things like that. Um, but what it also showed is that these products and these companies are really important to us. And so do we really understand um, how these companies operate and and kind of have transparency into the roles they play in our lives. And so where you thought people would be, you know, oh, we're so thankful, we'll stop kind of investigating, that was not the case. It's do we understand the role that technology is playing for us? So you have seen it come forward as far as kept momentum going and thinking about how fast technology is changing and then the fact that um, regulation and enforcement is not moving at the same pace. And so another thing that has, has brought the issues to the forefront again has been, you know, the recent developments at Facebook with the, uh, the whistleblower that, that came forward. And, and Facebook, you know, perhaps as, as large as any of these platforms, two and a half billion people, you know, a third of the, the world's population using this platform. Uh, what, what new have we learned and, and what's important out of uh, what's come from the, uh, the new complaints? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really important when we talk about something as complex as the news um, that's been revealed about Facebook is we really have to level set on what what has happened and what has been revealed. And so if we kind of go to the beginning, in September, the Wall Street Journal started releasing articles um, related to Facebook that they called the Facebook files. The, the, these articles were about um, the documents that were released by the whistleblower Frances Haugen. She revealed herself on 60 Minutes, then sat in front of Congress for a three-hour hearing discussing her findings. And so with this, it's important to know that a lot of what is being discussed is not new. Uh, and But there are kind of the, these incremental findings that give us kind of a, a lens into decision-making internally at Facebook that raise more questions for us as investors. And so I think when it's key, then when we talk about these issues, we have to kind of make a delineation between what is illegal that's happened and what's not illegal but raises questions. And so first in that bucket of what's potentially illegal, um, Haugen and her lawyers have filed eight SEC cases against Facebook potentially making the case that infra investors have not been given the information that um, maybe they that, that we would need. And so that's kind of a, a key case of what's actually happening. And then what's not necessarily legal but raises questions can kind of fit into the content moderation discussion, but is slightly different. So content moderation, think of it as, OK, um, you know, Sid's on Facebook. He sees terrorist content. He reports it to Facebook. They take it down. Um, that gets into the discussion of, is Facebook an arbiter of truth? Uh, Facebook, do Facebook doesn't want that. Governments don't want them to do that. It's a really complicated area. So think of content moderation as one bucket. And then in a, in a separate lens, think of algorithmic decision making. So what choices has Facebook had internally on what their algorithm can amplify? And so that's a little bit more information than we received through Frances Haugen's um, and the whistleblower's documents is around that decision making. And so she kind of gives some information around January 6th and what how they were able to kind of turn different levers um, throughout that process on, on management's end. And so there's some additional questions that we have there on do we have transparency into how the company operates? And so those are questions that our, our team is really 
looking at and trying to understand. And it's been helpful to use our, our framework of how does this fit into tech regulation, but is nuanced specifically for the company. Right. In some ways, it's kind of like a peek into the human soul. It's like, you know, Facebook's algorithms uh, try to promote, you know, these meaningful social interactions. And it appears what the data says is, you know, more inflammatory content that pushes you perhaps further in one direction leads to greater engagement. And how do you police that? Should you police that? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it's it's a challenge. And I think that the the best quote that I think I've heard as going through this research on tech regulation, um, I believe was at a Department of Justice Section 230 ses uh, conference that they had. And someone said, you know, everything you hate on the Internet is just human, the worst of humanity illuminated. And these are really difficult issues that as a society we're grappling with. And um, no one company or no one government is going to be able to fix. And so how do we kind of understand those issues when they really are so complex? And it's, as you said, looking into kind of humanity as a whole. Um, it's, it's really complicated. And our, our, our team is really trying to put those pieces together. And, you know, we're not going to have all the answers. And so how do you take such a complex issue and try to make sense of it? Um, it's, a, it's a really difficult question. But I like how you broke it down, though, into, you know, there are legal considerations that mm -hmm. we need to very much factor in. Then there are ESG considerations we also have to factor in, but, but in a different way, they pose different risks. And all of that needs to get fed in to the fundamental analysis of the company. How can this impact their business, their cash flows, uh, investor perception, the valuation you might get on the company? Um, Erica, I'm curious what you think of all this. Um, maybe you know the industry regulation is, is one issue, and then if, if you feel like you'd like to wade in on, on Facebook, uh, feel free. Yeah, th this is complicated. Data, privacy, content moderation, and transparency are all top of mind. And this isn't just Facebook. Um, to regulate or not regulate is, is the big question. So, well, let, let's think about your day. You wake up. One of the first things you do is grab your phone. You go to morning websites or you search for something on Google. That data is being recorded. Then you go to Facebook, and what you just searched for in Google is now in your Facebook news feed. Then you set your GPS to drive to work. That information is stored somewhere. You pay for coffee at a local restaurant or Starbucks with a credit card or a digital cash app. Somewhere what you did is being logged as part of consumer preferences for future sales. And Going to your point earlier, Sid, digital technology has created this behavioral interconnectedness. And at what point does this behavioral interconnectedness start influencing your decisions each day? And where are the boundaries for privacy now and, and going forward? And this really isn't just about social media. Some of the world's largest companies hold data about you, and it's a lot of data. And, you know, these companies are playing a big and growing role in our days and in our lives. And the question remains, at what point do these regulators step in? At, at the very least, consumers should have an option to opt out. But I mean truly opt out rather than it be a subject um, that you have to click a disclosure that many of us don't even understand. That's great, Erica. Thank you. Um... I'm sure more to come on this topic. Thank you, uh, Lauren, Erica, and Tom for joining me today, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. 